I'm under a great deal of pressure here today because I've got 2,000 years of history to squeeze into, uh, you know, like about 50 minutes. So, you know, bear with me. <laughs> that's, that's tough. Uh, there was a, uh, a man who bought a parrot, uh, and this guy had a parrot. He bought this parrot, he brought it home, and his parrot was always hurling insults at him. You know, it was brutal, insult after insult. Finally, the guy got fed up, got fed up with his parrot. And uh, so he put this parrot in the freezer. He says, I'll teach him a lesson. He put him in the freezer. And he got to thinking, man, maybe he's been in there too long. Got a little worried about this parrot that was in the freezer. So he opened it up, pulled him out, and he says, I'm sorry for all the insults that, that I've hurled at you. Can I, can I ask you a question? Yes, you can ask me a question. What... What did the chicken do? <laughs> so, he just got put in there for a little while, but what did the chicken do? Well, you kind of feel like when you look at the books of uh, the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3 that uh, you're in the freezer looking around at what's going on in there, and you're wondering what's going on with these folks that uh, have been... Uh, uh, been in the thick of the history of our day, uh, this thing called the church. Um, I'm going to try not to get bogged down. It's very difficult. There is so much here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give you a aerial view of chapters 2 and 3. An aerial view. This book is broken up for us as per... Uh, chapter 1, verse 19, where John is instructed by the Lord Jesus to write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, the things which he had seen were all uh, involved in chapter 1. He saw the glorified Christ making the announcement unabashedly and unapologetically. Uh, he says, I am the Almighty. He says that in verse 8 of chapter 1. And then he sees Jesus as the high priest in the midst of candlesticks and holding stars and sees him in his priestly garb and in his, what we might call his present role. Uh, the Lord Jesus is the one who is building his church. Remember that? He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the Lord Jesus is actively involved in what we are doing here today as we gather uh, we had noted last time we were together that he's the only CEO that attends every meeting. Okay, so he's here. He's moving through the midst of our, uh, of our seats, and he's, he's looking at each of us. And he's, in, he's the fruit inspector, if you will. He's the one who's constantly doing the assessing. Uh, the conviction that you feel sometimes. The Holy Spirit convicts us uh, sometimes when we have unconfessed sin. But the reality for you and me is that we need to realize he cares about what we're doing. And as we look at this continuum in chapters 2 and 3, what we have here is what we might call the answer to the 70 weeks of years prophecy of the Old Testament. The 70 weeks of years prophecy of the Old Testament set forth a, a continuum of a 490 year period that really is broken up into sections. Uh, one section uh, culminates in 483 years, and on the 483rd year, Jesus marched into Jerusalem. We call that the triumphal entry, and we, we celebrate it as Palm Sunday. Uh, when he came, he was presenting himself to the people of Israel as their king, and they rejected him as per that uh, prophecy that Daniel had given. But the interesting thing is, is it came, uh, he came on the very day after an edict was given, uh, that God's word tells us would be given. He came on the very day. Now, my point is this. God gave a catalog of Israel's history, and 483 years are now fulfilled. And the Bible says after the 483rd year, Messiah would be cut off, and then it talks about Jerusalem being destroyed. So we see this big gap that took place from the 483rd year uh, to that last and final week of years that is yet to come. That week is what's before us in chapters 4 to verse, uh, chapter 19. That one week where Israel, once and for all, will get themselves righted with God and subsequently be all on board for the millennial reign. It's going to be awesome. We've got an awesome future. 1948, they came back into their own land, and we look forward uh, to the Lord Jesus coming. 
We see birth pangs all around us, which we're told are to be part, of, part and parcel of our experience in the last days. Uh, you can read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And what we're seeing is, is we're seeing that Israel has their history laid out, but we do too. In chapters 2 and chapter 3, uh, chapter 2 and 3, what we have is a catalog of how the, uh, how the church age would unfold. And we looked at the first, uh, first chapter, uh, which is chapter 2 last time of this catalog, when John was told, write the things which you've seen, he saw Jesus, and now he says, the th- and write the, the thing, uh, about the things which are, and that's this right now. This is the church age. And I want to give you a couple of hangers you can put your mind around, if I may. If you look at these churches, they are seven in number. The Ephesus church will represent for us the apostolic church. The Smyrnian church is the accosted church. They're the church under persecution. So I'm giving you hangers that are alliterated so you can remember these. They're the church that was accosted. They were persecuted. The Pergamos church is the apprehended church. You see, when they became under when they came under great deal of persecution, it gave way ultimately to the church and state marrying. Okay, and now the church was apprehended and basically hijacked. Subsequent to that was the church at Thyatira. We might call that the antagonistic church. You'll see why in a little while. But it's like the antagonistic church. It's the one that literally took position against the Lord Jesus, if you will, and began to be corrupted in a very huge way. Next, we have the church at Sardius. We might call it the animated church. It answers to the time of the Reformation because they have a a testimony or a name or a reputation that they were alive, but they were dead. And and the word Sardis literally means escaping. Okay, They're the ones who finally got out from under that uh, regime of the church of Thyatira. The Philadelphian church represents for us the awakened church because the great awakenings taking place in 1700s and the 1800s represents a time where really there was an upswing in the movements of God's people in so much that they couldn't find buildings big enough to house people. Okay, for their meetings. So they had these open air campaigns. They had big leather lung preachers who could uh, kind of speak to a crowd and and could be heard throughout maybe city corridors of cities or even out in the open air. Uh, They didn't have sound systems, of course, in those days. So it's the awakened church. And then you have the church at Laodicea before us, and you might call them the, the apostate church. Now there's your catalog. Now let me see if I can kind of dive in here and help bring some clarity. If you were to take the Ephesian church and you were to look at it, we looked at it deliberately last time, but by way of review, remember this. They had a problem in their midst, but first and foremost, they are the Ephesian church. And that means that they are the the apostolic church. The word Ephesus means desired. They were everything God desires for you and me. The Bible says in Psalm 51, 6, Behold, thou desirest truth... In the inward parts, and in the hidden parts, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. This uh, Ephesian church, if you will, was a church of the apostles. It was the apostolic church. If we were to put some timelines on this, we could say from about 33 A.D. to about 100 A.D. was the apostolic age of the church. Uh, Ephesus had John as their pastor for a season. Timothy was their pastor for a season. Uh, Paul was their pastor for a season. You may remember that when Paul left Timothy in Ephesus, uh, when he wrote to him in First, uh, First Timothy, he said, I left you there that you might put things in order. Remember that? He says, now the end or the ultimate goal of the commandment to stay there and put things in order was love. He said, I want you to help them to come together, to be more loving, not to get off to the left and the right. Remember, he said there are many of wanting to be teachers of not understanding how to do all that. He says they're missing the point. They're swerving. He says the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and of faith unpretended. So the problem was even in Timothy's day. I need you to help them emphasize love. In the Ephesian uh, letter that the Lord Jesus sends, in chapter 2 here, uh, verses 1 down to verse 7, they had a problem. The problem was they had left their first love. So it connects, and it's kind of interesting. 
we cannot understate the importance of maintaining the disposition of love as Christians. Is that true? That's true, right? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples and that you have love one for another. Now understand this because in this picture that we have, it's a mirror. And yes, we're excited about the truth. We love the Word of God. We want to champion the Word of God. But the problem is, is that truth has a tendency to become a, a, a weapon. You know, if you know something and you know you're right, it's easy to get a little indignant when other people disagree. And you know you're right. And we live in a world that has completely uh, lost a sense of place. We are so enthralled by the gadgets and by the uh, activities and by the opportunities that have offered themselves to us. The Bible talks about it in uh, the book of Daniel that in the last days that knowledge would increase, men would be running to and fro. It was going to be a very big time of, of, uh, of delusion. Thessalonians tells us God's going to send strong delusion that men might believe a lie. And what we're seeing is all of that's happening. But that makes it more important than ever that we don't forget to love the Lord Jesus. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, to consider what these guys did in Ephesus was that they championed truth. He says, I know your work. I know you can't bear them that, that, uh, that say that they're apostles and they're not. You've tried them. You've tested them. You've proven to, the, to yourselves and to others that these are false apostles. He says, you've tested them. You've gotten down into the dirt and the difficulty of trying to call somebody to the mat over that which is evil. Do you know there's a lot of a need for that today? More of us need to be pointing out, not to others, but certainly to ourselves, and calling something evil. There's a whole lot of evil on TV. And I'm not talking about the secular channels, folks. <laughs> because the problem is not the secular world. <laughs> the problem is the Christian world. You see, Christendom is not necessarily Christianity. Christendom involves every breed of cat that talks about being a church or claims to be a Christian. You know, in America, people automatically say they're Christian because they're American. And obviously, if there were more Christians, uh, we would not have the problems we have in our country, would we? But the vast majority of Americans would say they're Christian just simply because they were born in America. No, we need to point it out. We need to go there. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You have to test the spirits. And when we talk about testing, the word is a piros. It literally means to pierce. You need to drill into it. If you've got a Joel Osteen telling you your best day is now, right on the surface of that, you know he's lying because our best day is not now. Our best day is later. And that's on the front burner. I don't have to drill too far. I can look at what he's saying and how he won't mention sin. He won't mention hell. He wants to tell everybody they're wonderful. And I can tell you that is not the narrative of the Scriptures. The Bible says we're all sinners, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved, that many are going to be cast into outer darkness saying, Lord, didn't we do many good works in your name? You'll say, I never knew you. There needs to be some warning going on there. But if you were to test him, he would say, it's not my ministry. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, his ministry's got a little slithering tongue going on there. And I'm just saying. You see, you've got to test it. Now, when I say it, I realize we're in a day of what we might call political correctness. There's also spiritual correctness. You, as a believer priest, have to test the spirits. But... As we go along and we get more knowledge, the Bible says knowledge, what? Puffs up, right? It will stop us from loving. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And we need to remember our first love. We talked about it being that which was intuitive. When we got saved, we wanted somebody else to know about this. When I got saved, I wanted to tell my friends. I brought them to church because I wanted them to get saved too. I wanted everybody in on this. I had the privilege of leading that young man to the Lord here last Tuesday, on Tuesday evening. Came over, had some pizza with him, and talking and answered his questions. When he got saved, after, we, he, after he asked the Lord Jesus to save him, he says, you want to know how it feels? He's, he's, it just feels lighter. He says, 
again, it feels lighter. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to cry. I want everybody to know that. But if I'm out there with a lack of love because I'm constantly doing the good warfare, I'm trying to maintain my own, you know, place, keep my own stance solid, it tends to puff me up more I know, and I might tend to go into the world and be condescending. He says, I have something against you to the Ephesian church, the apostolic church. They were fighting on every front. It was Ephesus. The devil loves to go right where the, the epicenters are uh, of the good. We mentioned Plymouth Rock up in the northeast, up in the New, ha uh, New England states. You tend to be more secular. It's the most secular part of America. That's where we started. We had all this spiritual fervor. You remember the Mayflower Compact. You ought to look that up sometime and read it. These guys were here with fear and trepidation that they might disappoint God. And they started this country with a heart for God. And so it's an epicenter of Christendom. But now it's the most secular. You talk about the mosque. They wanted to build a mosque on ground zero. Remember that? They took it down and the devil wanted to flood in and build a mosque there. Flood it with darkness. My point is, is that the devil works like that. And we have to be careful not to be a touchstone uh, for their objections. And if we understand who we are, we will begin to say with Paul, this is a faithful say, and it is worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. If we put on airs as if we're somehow better and somehow got it all together, we may be found to be liars. Because what we're saying is we got it together. If we don't say it out loud, we try to portray that. I need to tell people I don't have it together. I need to tell people in all humility that I have no claim to any kind of position except that Jesus saved me. And I've not gotten over it. And I want to tell you how He can save you too if you're not saved. How you can grow in Christ if you would want to do so. We need to be like Jesus. He took upon Himself what? The form of a servant. And what we have to do is remember that. So the apostolic age was from the... 33 to about 100. But after 100, all the apostles had fallen off the scene. John was writing this, uh, this prophetic book about the 92 or something like that A.D. he was writing. And so what we have with him is he's really the last vestiges of the apostolic age. When he dies, it's over. Move into what we call the Smyrna age of the church. Smyrna comes from the word myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh they brought at Jesus' uh, birth. But they also brought myrrh and other spices to his death because myrrh was used as a spice that they would crush and it would be a, a, an aromatic way to prepare a dead body and they would use it there. So even from his birth, he, there was a, a, a looking forward to his death in bringing him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the Smyrnian part of the church age represents for us the accosted church. Now, again, let me tell you what we said and maintain throughout. These churches represent churches in every time. Every time throughout the history of the church. There's always some of these churches somewhere in the midst. But they were real churches in real time. Real time, every time, but across time. That's what I want you to get. Across time. And so there's Smyrnian churches now. They're accosted. We see churches that are uh, being blown up, right? We've seen that in Africa. We've seen that in the Arab states. We've seen that in Iraq. We've seen people being beheaded. We've seen it in India. And you know, what we see is that there are churches that are accosted. And for those churches, what we see is that Jesus wants them to maintain something very specifically. He says of himself in verse 8, he says, I'm the first and the last. I was dead and am alive. And he that was dead and is alive. And he wants them to see that you got to get over worrying about dying. <laughs> you got to get an eternal perspective. In fact, in verse 11, he tells them, he says, He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. So he's giving them a very deliberate encouragement to look beyond what they're seeing in the sword and in the arenas. This part of the church age lasted from about 100 to 312 A.D., this part of the church was a time where you came up with things uh, like the Colosseum in Rome, uh, which was used to kill Christians, cast them to the lions, burn them at the stake. People just come in droves to see this. 
It was from this time of the, in the church history that we find the statement that has come to us, down to us, the blood of the saints has become the seed of the church. You see, the reality is, is that when those people came into those arenas, they had other games too, but the people began to think, I have nothing to die for. Do you know when you're really, really mature is when you get to the place where you're not worried so much about death? Now, you, maybe you're really, really tired. <laughs> but when you're spiritually clear, you understand. Jesus has got you. And, and the Bible says that the, the sting of death is the law, uh, but Jesus sets us free from the law, right? And so as you grow in your faith, you begin to realize He satisfied the law. He completely fulfilled the law. He has taken care of everything. And we begin to understand that precious now in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. And suddenly we begin to get over this thing that all our lifetime we were subject to, which is the fear of death. The Bible says that the Son was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And the one of the great works of the devil is to keep people paranoid and petrified about dying. Now for you and me, we don't live that way. We don't worry about death until we get sick. Because we're so busy. I like to say in our generation, we go from cradle to grave with our feet hardly touching the ground. It's so busy. Not busy in necessarily good things. It was Ravi Zacharias who made this comment. He said, we have perfected better means to the same end. <laughs> okay, so uh, wickedness and sin prevail, but we've just gotten better at it. Okay, we've got better at it. And so it is that we need to remember he gave the persecuted church an admonition. He gave them no correction, which he typically gave to these churches. Only two do not get a correction. These guys did not get a correction. They were just encouraged. You're doing good. You're, you're, you're poverty stricken. You're suffering. I want you to know out of the gate you're going to have ten days of persecution. Many link that to the ten decrees of the Caesars of the day. Ten specific decrees that open season on Christians throughout this 200 year period. Open season. You can kill them. Go ahead. It's okay. You bring them to us and we will put them in the arenas. We don't care. You take them out. Why? Well, partly because they were at a time where there was emperor worship going on. And though Rome allowed all kinds of religious persuasions, the one thing they would not countenance is that you would not swear allegiance to Caesar as Lord, meaning God in their vernacular. This is why it's significant when the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. He's writing to who? The Romans, <laughs> okay? He's right there at the heart of Rome saying you need to confess with your mouth not the Lord Caesar, but the Lord Jesus. That made them enemies of the state. And for 200 years, these people were on the run for the most part. We came up with not only the Colosseums and so forth, but we also came up with the catacombs. You see, they, they began to watch these Christians during this period of time. And part of it was that they would die nobly. But also part of it was when somebody who was a Christian died, they would take their bodies and they would put them in some sort of a, a stretcher type thing or whatever. And you've heard of the catacombs, right? But when they would take them to these places, the, the, the lost would see these people as walking almost in triumph. <laughs> this guy's died and they're marching in victory. They weren't afraid. They would say, pick me. But when they died, their people who were left behind would rejoice. These people were crushed and they brought forth an, an aroma, you see. So from 100 to 312, you have the church called Smyrna. Next, you have the Pergamos church. The root word for Pergamos is the word gamos. We get the word bigamy, polygamy, monogamy. The word gamos means marriage. The word per means to be fully married. And that's why I've designated it as the apprehended church. Uh, what happened in this uh, season was that Constantine, who was emperor at the time, had some sort of a vision when his back was against the wall. He had no way of overcoming such a great host out there, but he has this vision of some cross in the sky through the clouds or whatever. He hears a voice or sees a writing. It's not totally clear exactly how this unfolded, but he, he saw it and he, he got the impression in this sign conquer. So he, write, he paints crosses on all of his shields, goes out against an insurmountable uh, host, and he wins. And at that point, he declares that Christianity is the religion of Rome. And at this point, things get really weird. 
because he begins to bring together all of the elders he can find who are scared to death to come out of the, you know, out of the foxholes and caves that they found themselves in, hiding. But he gets about 700 of them to come into his presence and he solicits them uh, for information about Christendom. He sets up councils, and a lot was hammered out during this time. So there was some good stuff that happened uh, during this age because it was all innocently done. But something that was not solicited uh, was that they would get thrones, but they did get thrones. Those who cooperated with uh, Constantine were given thrones, luxury, and you know all of the accoutrements of, of the high life, and they began to say, you know what? We're in the halls of authority. We can influence authority. And so they really were living large on that. But I told you they brought in about 700. About half of them would not cooperate. They became the nonconformists. They said, no, <laughs> we can't do that. The other half said, no, we're going to get in here. We're going to try to do some good. And what happened was, is that was where the nonconformists went underground. These were the people who would come popping their heads up periodically. When they did, they would be persecuted. They would be persecuted by those who were in seats of authority, even though they were religious seats of authority. And these guys were the nonconformists. Those, uh, those are those that we would identify ourselves with, pretty much, because we would look back over history, and we would see them as being like we are. We're trying to maintain a standard and keep our eyes on the Lord. But look at Pergamos in verses 12 down to verse 17. A few things I'd like to highlight for you. First of all, when Jesus identifies with them, he, he identifies with them as saying, I am he that has the double-edged sword coming out of my mouth. Why would he say that? Well, the reason is because he intends to judge severely people who compromise. Uh, because when these people compromise, what they did was they influenced others to do so as well. Now think about that, because that's going to come back again. The reason Jesus deals very severely with certain, uh, certain religious movements or whatever, that's because of the influence that they wield. We're going to see that very deliberately in the Laodicean church. But he says he comes uh, with a sword, and he says, I know your works, where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas... Uh, was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, I'm not going to drill into that, but I'm telling you it's awesome to drill into. What he's talking about, the Temple of Zeus and the things that were there, Antipas was a pretty cool guy. When they were fighting in those councils about, say, the deity of Jesus Christ, Antipas was a guy who was a missionary, and he had many marks on his body. He's listening to these guys go back and forth about whether Jesus is God or Jesus isn't God. He says, I can't stand it anymore. And those on the council look at him and he says, don't you realize that the whole world is against your view? He says, then I am against the whole world. <laughs> Jesus is God. Antipas means against all. Very interesting. He stood for what was right in the midst of that awesomeness of being in the cathedrals. You know, when you go into a, a courtroom, right, many times years back, more so than today, but many times they were high and lofty and they were echoey chambers and they tried to get that august feel. And that was what Antipas stood for. But he stood against them and the way they killed him was they hollowed out a bull, they put him inside and they roasted the bull till the, uh, the, uh, the, the smoke came out of its eye. Antipas took a stand, and it cost him something, but he took a stand against this marriage, in one sense. He's almost like the John the Baptist, okay, of the church age. John stood against Herod for having his brother Philip's wife, and here he is saying, I'm against this marriage, this isn't right, because what you're doing uh, has some pretty powerful compromises. What were some of them? Verse 4 says uh, that they have there that, them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. He also says in verse 15, something that he said to the Ephesian church, he says, uh, you hate the things of the Nicolaitans, but he says in verse 15 of the Pergamos age of the church, uh, it says, uh, you have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now the Nicolaitans has the knit into its word or its verbiage, the idea of conquering the people. Now this is where the clergy and the laity split. This is where the clergy became the professional Christians and the people began to say, I put in my hour, I'm going to go do my own thing. It got so bad eventually where they began to sell indulgences because the people were taught in Latin uh, during the Dark Ages, which we'll talk about in Thyatira more. But man, it got so bad that they were buying licenses to sin. 
And what you had is you had the church age uh, getting darker and darker. But this is at the outset. There's still a honeymoon going on. It's going to take a, a while. In fact, the church age of Pergamos goes from about 312 to the 600s or the 7th century. Because it wasn't until the 7th century that the papacy began to become all supreme. Uh, the pope became the, 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 the supreme ruler of the church. That was when that finally coagulated to that point. So we get to Thyatira on the heels of that. But let me back up a second. Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam, what was that? Well, the doctrine of Balaam was a doctrine that taught uh, Balak that he couldn't curse God's people, but he could get God's people to bring a curse on themselves. And in the days of Balaam and Balak, Balaam told Balak, if you'll send your girls down there, they will fall into fornication and God will judge them. And that was part of what was going on with this Pergamus marriage under Constantine. Why? Well, because Constantine began to make religion of Rome Christian, and we got sprinkling because they were people getting, you know, brought into the church in mass. They began to pray to saints because they used to have Zeus and, you know, Aphrodite, Venus. They began to name them Christopher and, you know, Joseph and Mary, and you had the you know, all this stuff began to be put together and mailed it. And what that was was a spiritual fornication. And that spiritual fornication would bring judgment. And what was the judgment? God's wrath is revealed from heaven, right? How is it revealed? God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. That's Romans chapter 1. When people go headlong into sin, God gives them up. And that's what happened during the time of the Pergamos church. Throughout that historical period, uh, they were getting darker and darker, and it would give way to this um, uh, church at Thyatira. The other thing they had was this love of the Nicolaitans, which was the clergy laity thing. Nicolaitans means uh, to conquer the people, and that's where clergy laity began to split. Bishops or whatever became the professional Christians, and everybody else had a pass. They didn't have to do too much. And so the Nicolaitans was a problem that, that, the, peop that the people were subjected to the, to the pastors rather than believer priests. And the other problem was the doctrine of Balaam. So just see these pictures. I'm kind of skipping you through it uh, because I could drill into so much. But when he comes down to the end of that section, he says, Repent, verse 16, lest I come unto you and fight with you with the sword of my mouth. That's powerful. So he says, I've got the sharp two-edged sword. You guys are on a terrible trajectory here. And if you don't repent, you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of this. He says in verse 13, I know your works. You know, they did a lot of works. There was a whole lot of that going on. Judaism constantly kept saying you have to do works. Uh, there was all those legalists. Sometimes they were legalists of the Judaism and all that. But their works were there. And there were still some conscience there. But as time went on, the conscience dimmed, 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 and got real dark. And eventually it gave way to the church at Thyatira. Now we talk about the church at Thyatira as being the antagonistic church because the word Thyatira means continual sacrifice. It was about the 7th century when the first pope was seen as the supreme leader of the church. Uh, and therefore, basically, really dethroning Jesus over the church. You know the, the Pope was called the vicar of Christ. You ever heard of the vicarious atonement? That means substitutionary atonement. He died for me. Vicar means he's the substitution of Jesus. This is why when he speaks in ex cathedra, uh, you've got a, um, a problem, because he's said to be infallible. But he's, they've changed their mind ex cathedra many times. Now, let me just say something here. I am naming names, <laughs> okay? I'm telling you what I believe this to mean. I may not be able to do this in 10 years. So write it down. Because we live in a day of not only political correctness, but spiritual connect correctness. And many people today have come back to Rome. They've opened themselves up to Rome again. But Rome now is even showing its colors. They're countenancing uh, the lost, secularist, humanist. That they're even saying they could be saved. They're just good people. This Pope that we have right now was a Jesuit. I'm naming names. You see, my point is, is that you can't teach the Scripture without naming names. Because if we're going to identify what is error, uh, we're going to have truth and have to identify error. And when you see the word continual sacrifice, do you realize that's the Mass? They do a sacrifice. That's why they're called priests, because what they do is they offer the sacrifice of Jesus. They bring the body down. They say, behold the Lamb of God. People genuflex when they come in. That's where they get down on one knee and cross themselves, because they're crossing themselves to a tabernacle that has wafers in it. They believe Jesus is in that box. And he says, behold the Lamb of God. 
continually what? Sacrificing him. And what do they do? They pronounce words over this wafer and they say, the body of Christ. And they put a wafer in somebody's tongue. And, and it becomes, in their minds, transubstantiated. Literally, substantially turned into the body of Jesus. Now, that all may sound like theatrics, but the reality is, they, they go along and play it. Play it out. Because we live in America. But a lot of people in third world countries, they're just wide-eyed and saying, just tell me what I need to do. And some of them are still being oppressed like repentance, penance. They'd have to crawl across the street through the city on their knees and to make payments for their sin. So the church at Thyatira represents the antagonistic church because it began to really take on a whole new thing. They became priests. They began to have a continual sacrifice. And that's what's significant about the way Jesus identifies with them. In verse 18, he says, I'm the one with eyes like a flame of fire and feet like br fine brass. Why? Because his eyes and his feet are associated with a sacrifice. Sacrifices were burnt offerings, typically. And so he was saying, I've been in the fire. It's in my eyes. It's in my feet. But also, I see you. I know what your heart really is. And you know what that means? That means some of them very well might be saved. Do you know there's enough gospel in the Catholic Church for somebody to get saved? I had a guy give me a track once when I was about 18. I was, he had a big cross. I said, oh, <laughs> man, nobody ever gave me a track. Thanks. I said, where do you go to church? And he told me the Catholic Church, local Catholic Church. I said, what? Really? You're giving me a track? You're from the Catholic? He said, they need to be saved too. So he was in there working, sharing Christ and trying to get some people shaken loose. All I'm saying is, is that he's pointing to things in his, in, his, uh, in his visage that was in chapter 1 that point out that he was involved with a sacrifice, the true sacrifice. Verse 19 says, I know your works, your charity, your service, your faith, your patience, and your works. You see that? Works, works, works. You know, Catholicism throughout the history of the Dark Ages, which, which is what these guys brought us into, was the Dark Ages, where everybody was getting it in Latin, nobody knew what was right and wrong. They'd see the images, ask a few questions. Some of them would get enough information to find Christ as the Savior, and they'd say, these priests, they're a joke, I don't want that, and they would go past them and go right to Jesus, okay? They, they got it, because God can, right? Just like Judaism. Think about how Judaism was. People got fixated on the sacrifices and forgot about God, okay? That's why God would say to them, I have no delight in sacrifices and burnt offerings. You know, they, they're an odious to me, because they were supposed to see past the accoutrements to the king. Now, what we're seeing here is he says, works, works. Verse 19, I know your works, charity. Done. They've done a lot of things. They, they started uh, orphanages, and they started hospitals, and they started all kinds of things like that. Uh, feed the poor. And so there's some good in there. But you know what? You get a crowd doing something like that. If the leadership theologically are trained in Latin and all that, if they particularly go forward... And they know, and they get it, and they say, well, I'm just going to deny that, I'm going to just go, and they're still doing good works. They're culpable. They know what they're doing. But if these guys down under them are hearing Jesus and thinking we're doing for God, and those people are like, you know, they're sheep. And some of them will get it. And they're living for Jesus and loving on God and doing the right thing in what system they had afforded them. You see? This is why he can say to them, I have a few things against you, verse 20. Because you suffered Jezebel, and I don't want to drill too much into that. He says, uh, gave her place to repent. Read verse 22, I will cast her into bed. And it says, and, and all them that commit, verse 22, adultery with her into great tribulation. Underline that. Because he's saying, yes, you're a church, but you're not my church. This church is going through the great tribulation. We're going to find a guy called the false prophet in chapter 13. He's going to have, he's going to have a horn like a lamb. He's going to be like a lamb, a horn like a lamb or whatever. And he's just going to speak nice words. He comes up out of the society. And, and I believe personally that that's going to be the pope of the day. He's going to be the one who's going to say, there he is. There's the beast. There's the enemy. But he's Messiah. You see, religion has always played a part in keeping society together. When the wheels are cut off, uh, kicked out of the, off of the vehicle, uh, this, by the rapture, these people are going to have to deal with uh, uh, some kind of an answer. And uh, when he says he's going to make that, he's going to kick them into great tribulation. That's significant. He, I want to drop down. He says, "He that overcometh, verse twenty-six, to him will I give power." Circle the word power, because from a Catholic perspective, it's a lot about power, right? Think about the Old Testament. What did the Old Testament have? It had kings. And the kings had at their right hand and at their left counselors, prophets. See, Catholicism looked back at the old and they said, you know what? They had priests, they had influence, they had prophets, they had influence. What we'll do is we'll be that 
to the new section of history, the new covenant. And the priest, many times you'd have uh, popes excommunicating kings. <laughs> and kings banishing pre, uh, popes. It was a lot of, you know, back and forth with these guys. Because they became the throne of God representative. And you know, it was only like about 20 or so years ago that the Vatican got a, a seat at the United Nations. It's, it's kind of an interesting continuum. But what I want you to see is in Thyatira, you have that from the 7th century to 1517. Uh, and that's where we get the uh, Church of the Reformation. Uh, look at verse 25 again. I want to show you. He says, that which you have already hold fast. There were people in there who were saved. These would have been the sheep. They didn't get the depths. You know, they didn't think about it. They just did what they were told. The regime they were under was a regime of error, but it was all they had. You couldn't have a Baptist church down the road and around the corner from them because you'd be killed. You've heard of the Inquisition? It was run by Jesuit priests. By the way, the new pope is a Jesuit. They put people to death, put them on the rack drawn and quartered them, burnt them at the stake as heretics. All of these things happened under the umbrella of religion and Christianity. This is why today when people say Christianity is so violent, they're looking at all that stuff. But that's not Christianity at all. It's Christendom, but it's not Christianity. The spirit of Christianity is never to force people to come to salvation. You've heard of the Crusades. That was also Catholicism. They would tell you, there was something very, very interesting about that. Uh, it was the Knights Templar, evidently, who came up with the banking system. And what you would do, you were given a pass into heaven if you'd go fight for the Crusades, getting rid of the Muslims, okay? You'd go fight. But you, you had to journey from point A to point B over about five or so hundred miles. If you died along the way, they got to keep the money. <laughs> and a lot of them died along the way. If you died in battle, they got to keep the money. It was their way of saying, we got the money here, you get there, it'll be there for you. If they never made it, they got to keep the money. They became one of the richest groups of people in the, in the ancient world by doing that. But here we have him saying some of them didn't know. Look at verse 24. You have not known the depths of Satan. There's some really insidious things here. You have to study that on your own. But what he does say is he says, He that overcometh, I'll give power, in verse 26, over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. You see, if people who are in the hierarchy, you know, offices repent, they're going to have more than they ever could have had down here. So he's, he's really appealing to those who know better. They know better. You repent, I'll give you power. You're going to have power. You know what? The Bible says they that suffer with Christ will what? Rule and reign with him, right? We're going to have that. It's called the millennial kingdom. We're coming back with Jesus, amen? <laughs> That's a good thing. When we come back with him, he's going to set thrones up, and the thrones uh, will be set upon by the people of God who truly have been born again if we've suffered with him. Verse 27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And verse 28, and I will give them the morning star. I love this because it reminds me that the church is going to be raptured. But this is kind of in the dark ages. So all through they were being solicited to get right with God. But if they died before Jesus came, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> and so the morning star is that first one you see. And subsequently... It reminds me of the fact that those who truly did repent and get right with the Lord will be given the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Now, this is a refrain over and over again. Verse 11, verse 29, and so forth. You'll see it. He that hath an ear, verse 17, let him hear. He, he, he that hath an ear. What he's saying is, in every church across time, and every church in real time, and in every church in each time, he's saying individuals have to pick this up. You have, if you're involved in that system, you've got to get this. Because if you don't get this, you ain't going where you want to go. You're on the wrong road. Chapter 3 brings us the church at Sardis. The word Sardis means escaping. <laughs> and this represents for us the Reformation church. That's why we make it 1517, because this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. So we're celebrating the Reformation right now. What happened in the Reformation? Martin Luther got a clue. <laughs> He, would faint. he fainted the first time he did the Mass. He said, man, this is the body of Christ. <laughs> that was just too big of a deal for him. He had a sensitive heart. And now ultimately he began to read the Scriptures. He began to realize it was, it was, it was not correct what was going on in, the, in, the, in Rome. And, and subsequently he began to make a break for it. And the Bible says, in, under the church at Sardis write, uh, He that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, and that thou hast a name and that thou livest and art dead. 
Now, you know, when Lutheranism was born, there was a lot of good things. That I mean, a lot of people began to have a flag under which they could walk. They could say, you know, this is right. This is what makes sense. They got the Word of God in their own German language over there. Uh, you, have, uh, you had people beginning to get saved by faith alone. They cast off Rome. Uh, they cast off the, the confessional. Uh, but they kept some stuff. Okay, they kept baby baptism. Uh, they kept uh, the garb, okay, which made them really associated with some of the vestiges of all that combining of things. You know, you can't imagine Jesus wearing a white collar, right? You can't. You see him wearing you know, what they wore. Everybody wore a, a robe. He wore what people wore. And my point is, is that these guys had a reputation or a name that they were alive, but they were dead. Now, what's that mean? <laughs> Well, that means that even after they came out, a lot of the reformers that really brought Luther into a good place where he could do what he did uh, were people like Calvin and people like Zwingli and people like uh, Tyndale. These guys all died, but they didn't really bring it in. It was Luther who had the position as a professor priest who began to put up the 95 Theses and say, oh, this is wrong. Part of it was the, the indulgences we talked about a moment ago. He says, this doesn't make any sense. They built St. Peter's Cathedral with sin, sin license. Uh, the history t records for us that what they would do is they would say, when a coin uh, in the pot rings, a family member from Purgatory Springs. I mean, that was they just had these ideas. People understood. But, but Luther couldn't go there. He had a sensitive heart. Sardis means escaping. He escaped, and people escaped that were with him. But after a while, they began to allow things to happen in their midst. Like, they began to kill people. They began to kill Anabaptists. Anabaptist, Anna means again, Baptist is again. They would say, you get saved, then you get baptized. And they would insist upon a baptism after salvation. Not a baby baptism, but after you're saved, you get baptized. Okay, that's, that's the way it goes. Baby baptism is nowhere in the Bible. It's got to be, you identify with Christ, buried, rose again, picture, it was immersion. And so they would say, you want baptism? They drowned them. <laughs> they drowned them. And Calvin was consenting to it. Luther was consenting to it. Uh, they were anti-Semitic after a while. So they had some things. They just it, These guys had a lot to overcome. And they had a name because they did some good things. And that's why he says, what I want you to do in verse uh, 2 of chapter 3 is I want you to be watchful, strengthen the things which remain and that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect. Perfect. Uh, before God. The word perfect is plurao, means complete. You didn't do all you needed to do. You didn't make the full break. You know, they had celibacy. Luther came around eventually and he married a woman. So, you know, he was getting it, but he just didn't complete the thing. Verse uh, 3 says, Remember now, therefore, that how thou hast, and, and circle this word, how, verse 3, how thou hast received and heard. Because they received and heard by reading the Word of God. It wasn't about looking at what Rome did and what would be acceptable in society. They just need to remember how they, how they received. And if they would have done that, they would have been okay. But he says, but I'm going to come if you don't repent, in verse 3, if you don't watch, I'm going to come upon thee as a thief. Circle that word, thief. Why? Because the Bible says Christians are not in the darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. Think about that. So if he overtakes them as a thief, it's because they're not teaching it. They're not ready for Christ. They don't believe fully the Word of God. Many churches don't even teach the Word of God when it comes to the book of Revelation. They don't teach the rapture, or they take an issue with the rapture. And he says, if you don't, if you don't get watchful here, you're going to miss, and you're not going to know, and I'll come upon you as a thief. And 1, Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about those that he comes upon as a thief are people who are altogether uh, left behind. But we are not in the darkness that that day should overtake us, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. But he says to them, if you don't watch, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss the whole point, and you're going to find yourself on the outside. But he says in verse uh, 5, he says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, because Jesus clothes us in his righteousness. And, and I will not blot out his name. The, word, I will, the words, I will not blot out, is a double uh, emphasis. It literally means, I will in no way blot your name out. In other words, one of the things they really would need is the security of salvation that has been fully paid for. Those who were involved in much of the Protestant movements in history of the church have a problem with security. So they do a lot of works. They get caught up in good works, but they don't have security because they don't understand how 
<laughs> Christendom came about. They haven't been reading the Bible. And the Bible says, I will in no way cast out. He that comes to me, I will in no way cast out. He says, I will in no, by no means, I will by no means blot your name out of the book. And we could drill into that, but we will not. Verse 6 says, he that hath an ear. You have this church of the Reformation in Sardis. Sardis age group went from 1517 to about the 1700s, if you want dates. They are the animated church. But Philadelphia comes before us in verse 7. Philadelphia is the awakened church. As I said a moment ago, these are the ones who literally awakened themselves, but also awakened uh, people. You know, when things were happening in America, the 1700s, right? 1800s. England and, and America, they were getting lit up. Preachers, leather lung preachers preaching in open air. And this also is a church that has no condemnation. Where the others were told, if you overcome, if you overcome, Smyrna and Philadelphia have no need to be rebuked because they're getting it right. Okay? Uh, and what they're doing, the one is suffering down to the bone, and Philadelphia is preaching, and brotherly love was emitted. I remember the story of Whitfield and uh, Wesley as being friends when they were in college, and as they grew and moved on, uh, they both became great preachers, but they had a little different persuasion underneath the, cur underneath the circuit. So people wanted to drill into that and say, hey, uh, Whitfield, uh, do you think you'll see Wesley in, ch in, in heaven one day? Because their doctrine uh, differed in certain ways. And he says, uh, no, no, I don't think I'll see Wesley in heaven. He said, he'll be so close to the throne of God and I'll be so far back in the crowd that it won't matter. So he gave the homage to him that he had the faith in the gospel. He may not have had all agreement on every fine point, but brotherly love prevailed over petty disagreements. You see how powerful that is? Just like with Catholicism, you can't say all Catholics are lost, but you can say that if a person is teaching this is truth and they've drilled into it and it's conviction for them, even after they've looked at the facts, they've made a choice somewhere and those people will be culpable. But the people... Uh, may be able to see past the nonsense and get to Jesus. So what we see is Philadelphia is the church that's awakened. Both these men were doing things. Others were as well. Some of the great churches of, the, of our, of our uh, heritage come from this time. Spurgeon's church. Moody did a great work. You have huge messages being preached. You have Benjamin Franklin going to hear John, uh, Whitfield. Uh, in the uh, in the streets of Philadelphia at one point, and somebody says, "Oh, you got converted." Benjamin Franklin said, "No, I don't believe in that." He says, uh, "But he does." <laughs> okay, and I wanted to hear him. And he also did some little tests to see if he could hear him clearly. And even in the streets, Whitfield's uh, voice would would travel. He says, "I know your works." Verse eight. I've set a great door open to you. Now, that reminds us of Paul saying a great and effectual door. It was all about witnessing, okay? The door is about witnessing. Open door is about witnessing. And he says, I've opened a door to you and no man's going to shut it. They had 200 years of getting it right. America was birthed in this time, which is pretty cool. We have a great heritage to realize that. And uh, when you see that the America was birthed during this time, uh, you understand that there was something to be said uh, for what all they were getting done. And what they get is no reproof, but what they do get is they get a promise. He says in verse 12, he says, He that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. He says, I will write upon him, and this word name, it comes up three times. See, the other had a name that they were alive, but they're dead. But these guys were Philadelphia. He said, I'm going to give you a name. It's going to be a threefold name. I'm going to give you a name. He says, I'll write the name upon him, the name of my God. That means ownership. Uh, he says, I will write down to you the name of the city of my God. That means citizenship. Isn't that cool? And then he says, on a stone, I'm going to give you a new name, which nobody knew but you yourself. He's going to give him a new name, and, and that has for us uh, sonship. Because, you know, who names you? Your dad, right? <laughs> your dad and your mom. So he's getting a, a sonship. But these are neat things. Now let me get into this Laodicean thing, because this is the apostate church. This is the church at present. We go to 817 and 1800s, get into the 1900s, a lot of things happen. Uh, people were thinking everything was coming into its own, that world was getting better. Everybody was going to be on the upswing. We were going to get it so good that Jesus would come and he would receive the kingdom. <laughs> well, then World War I broke out. Then World War II broke out. <laughs> you began to see Vietnam. I mean, everybody say, wait a minute, maybe we need to go back and check our numbers. And in 1948, Israel was back in the land. A lot happened during this time. 
Higher criticism came in. Uh, they found two pieces of manuscript evidence, one from Vaticanus, which was in the garbage to be burned, and one, one, one priest pulled it out and said, we need to keep this. And one was down in Egypt called the Alexandrian text. They took these two texts and they said, look, these are older and better. They began to question the Bible, when in reality, in the backstory, the Textus Receptus only had a little bit of evidence at first, but all through these years, we've been getting many, many, many transcripts and manuscripts and uncles and all these things, and confirming the text once received by all, which is Textus Receptus. And basically, they began to make everybody wonder, are we doing the right thing? Like when you go to the Bible bookstore, and they say, what, what do you want? Oh, I need a Bible. Well, we got this, we got this, we got this. They'll never take you to the King James or the New King James. These are the only two based on the majority text in the Texas Receptus, but they will take you to all the new ones because they make more money on them. <laughs> okay, you get more money for a new international version if you have a bookstore. So we have a lot of things going on. It began to make everybody in the church begin to question things. In fact, the name Laodicea means the people rule. And what has happened in our day is things have happened like the 60s and the sexual revolution. We had abortion on demand, kicked God out of the schools in the 1960s. We had all this stuff happening and began, people began to get birth control. They didn't have to worry about immorality anymore. And everybody began to get caught up in having more stuff. There was affluence. And subsequently, the Bible says they got to the point where in verse 17, they thought, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I have need of nothing. But you know not that you're wretched, you're poor, you're miserable, naked and blind. Now he says, you're not cold or hot in verse 15. I would that you were either cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. What's that mean? Why would he do that? Why would he say that? He would say that because when people play Christianity and they become the majority playing Christianity and they don't have any heart for the true God, they don't even go to church because, you know, we're just choosing our own thing, you know. We'll go if there's a band. We'll go if there's uh, 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 places we can play. We'll go if you have something for our children. Listen to me. There's no verse in the Bible that says the church is supposed to bring up the children. And yet we've turned it into something it was never meant to be. Parents are supposed to bring up the children, but I don't want to engage, so I'm going to let it go. No, he seeks a godly seed. Why did he make them one? The two become one. Because he seeks a godly seed. He didn't make the church so he could get a godly seed. He made the church so that people could get saved, and they could learn, and they could teach their children. Now, I I just said some things that are controversial, right? Bands and things like that. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? The charismatic movement was the ones that brought it in, and then everybody else got on board, and we got down to Promise Keepers movements, which was started by a charismatic fella. And there were a lot of people on the planet. We, we have a continuum. Apostasy means we fall away. We step away, apple, away from the standard, standard. Uh, and what we have today is people are away from the standard. They don't go to church because they don't need it. They don't need it. They have need of nothing. But he says, I counsel you, buy me gold and try it in the fire. You know what that means? That means get out there and do something for Jesus in the real way. Do you know when you have a baby, it grows you up? It grows you up. Somebody said it well. Adults uh, don't make children. Children make adults. When you have a kid, you grow up, right? As a Christian, when you win somebody to Christ, you think, you know, I should probably be in prayer meeting. I should probably pray. (laughs) I should probably read my Bible. But what we have is we have a continuum on this church age that is going to come down to where the people rule. The people say, we want this, give it to us. The Bible says in the last days, people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, not willing to endure the truth. You see, that's the world we live in today. And I'm sorry to report it, but it is my deep-seated conviction. Whether people agree or don't agree, I believe we're in the last days. I believe Jesus is coming soon. I believe we've about worn out our welcome down here. I believe when you when he comes, he said, will I even find the faith on the earth? That's something to think about. And the lukewarm problem, what's wrong with the lukewarm church? It makes everybody think that's okay. Everything's okay. It's, there's nobody fired up about anything right, uh, and they're not even a- antagonistically against it. What they are is they're just kind of bleh, a marriage hodgepodge. And people think they are somehow saved by osmosis. I went to church all my life, I must be saved. Or I went to a concert and I felt a goosebump, I must be saved. Or, you know, my mom and dad told me I was saved at age four. My point is, he says, you think you got it going on. But you don't have any of it that matters. Now, I want you to know this is serious. He says in verse 18, he says, I counsel thee to buy me gold, try in the fire, that you may be rich, white raiment, that would be 
being a Christian, letting Christ robe you, uh, that you may be clothed and you shame of your nakedness not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve. And that means you have no perception of, of false teachers. When you're outside the faith, going doing Christendom, you don't have the ability to discern. And he says that you may see. You don't see, but you need to. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chase. And put a star by verse 19. He says, you want to know if you're really born again? You want to know? I rebuke and chasten people who are mine. <laughs> and if you're without chastening, you're illegitimate. The King James makes it a little harder, doesn't it? You have no father. And if you're getting away with being lukewarm, that is something for you to consider. I can't consider it for you. I have to consider it for me. Is there chastening? Are you being spanked? Do you feel bad when you sin? He says, know this, as many as I love, I chasten. I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. Now, this reminds us of where the Bible talks to us about Jesus in the last days. And it's Luke 12, he says, Blessed are those servants who, uh, when he comes, shall find watching. He says, Verily I say unto you that he, Jesus, will come and gird himself, and he will make them to sit down uh, to meet, and he will come forth and serve them. He says, I will sup with you and you with me. He says, But if when I come, the servants say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and he shall begin to beat his men servants and maid servants, and to eat, and to drink, and to be drunken, I'm going to come and give him a ton of stripes, because he's forgotten the plot. That's all in Luke chapter 12. You should read it. But he says, he that overcomes, in verse 21, I will give to sit with me in my throne, as my Father gave me the right to sit in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Beloved, this is a panoramic view, and hopefully I've not worn you out. But if you will take these words and remember that the Bible gives us a panorama view of what's going on, you will begin to realize that we're at the cusp of something awesome. And those of us who know the Lord Jesus are excited about what's coming, because we're not going to be here. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we're not appointed unto wrath, but to receive salvation. He says some of these churches are going to be cast into great tribulation. Some of these churches are going to be spewed out into great tribulation would be my thinking of what he's saying in that last section there. Beloved, we live in an exciting time. It may totally look unlike anything that history has ever seen before. We get baths and showers every day. We have heat and cold, and we, we, we got cars, we got airplanes, we are enthralled by the gadgets. We got it all, but that ain't who you are. You are a soul. And that soul will exist somewhere for all eternity, either in life and bliss or in eternal death and destruction. The Bible says that they that receive not the truth were cast into the lake of fire and would receive everlasting everlasting, everlasting destruction. We would not wish that on our worst enemy. Because to know all is to forgive all. People do not understand. We need to love them. They don't understand. Now, there are a few out there that are antagonistic because they do understand and hate God. But most people are ignorant of it all. And the devil sees to it. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded their minds lest they see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, of God in the, in the face of Jesus. The Bible says if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them. They're outside the faith. He says, I speak this to your shame. You and I have to be the people of God in this day, not forgetting our loving side, not being condescending to the world, but helping them. Would you bow with me for a moment?